Welcome back guys. Got some tinkering done on the 308 this weekend and I'm excited to show you as always, but I'll admit it's not a ton of progress. I got distracted primarily watching the best worst F1 race there ever was. But with that said, my boy Hamilton won. We're gonna get that driver's championship and all of you Max fans in the comments can uh, you know, type your hearts out. You guys are good at complaining. I'm ready for it. Let's hear what you got to say. But with that said, I'll show you what I got done nonetheless. I got some thoughts at the end of the episode for you and some other car content. I had friends here in the shop working on their stuff. We got some fender rolling happening, some burnouts here in the street, some just good old fashioned car content. So let's dive into it. So I'm admittedly feeling the pain of not having all of the parts that we need to actually finish this build up, but there are a lot of unfinished projects that we can be chipping away at. And today's project are the end tanks for our intercooler. Not the end tanks that we already built, but the end tanks for the water side of this water to air intercooler and heat exchanger system. We need a way to control water flow from one end of this core to the other. So I opened up Fusion 360 and drew up some really simple three piece end tanks. Fusion 360's sheet metal tool allows me to actually flatten this part out and give us a template including the bend lines. And we can transfer this to aluminum to make this a very simple part to make. Most of you guys have seen me do this countless times over, but it's one of my favorite tools at my disposal. And because Fusion 360 is free to use for hobbyists, it's one that I like to show you guys as often as I can. I'm using 14 gauge 5000 series aluminum for this project because I happen to have it around the shop and because it's very easy to work with. 5000 series alloy bends very easily and doesn't have a tendency to crack or actually fracture like 6000 series alloy does. My bandsaw blade leaves a pretty rough edge on all of the material, so I'm using a tiny flap wheel on the end of my die grinder to clean up the edges and give me a nice clean surface to weld to. We'll follow this up by brushing the surface of the aluminum with a stainless steel brush to remove any impurities, because aluminum is very picky about its level of cleanliness when you go to TIG weld it. These end tanks are technically three pieces each, so we need to cut some small end plates for each of these eventual trapezoid shapes. This is when the stomp shear truly shines. It cuts through aluminum like butter and allows you to remove very small amounts of material and keep perfectly flat edges. This allows us to get a really good fit up on all of our parts and pieces to make that aluminum welding as easy as possible. Although it is admittedly still pretty tough given my low level of experience. Next, we need to mark a center point on the front face of these end tanks. And fortunately, the templates that we cut out earlier will make that very simple to pull off. No measuring required. I'm using a Starrett 18C automatic center punch, and I'll put a link in the description of the video if you'd like to add one to your tool collection. I'm of the opinion that it's a must have. Now, let's get these things tacked together. These end tanks need a hole put in them so we can add our AN port to them. My drill bit decided to break though and send my hole saw crashing into the aluminum surface of the end tank, completely trashing it. There's no way to really recover from this, so we're gonna have to remake it, which leaves us with just one end tank for this episode. Definitely a bummer. I used a better hole saw holder and drill bit the second time around, and of course it worked without any issues. So maybe use the right tool for the job. I should follow my own advice. This is a pretty good indicator of what we're aiming to make. It'll need a lot of finish welding, but this will do the trick and will help guide our water flow through the intercooler core. 
The dimensions also happen to clear the rear bracing of the chassis and they clear the blow off valve in front of the intercooler. So everything seems to fit and I think overall this should work pretty well. I'm just taping it into place for the time being so we can get an idea of how it'll look and to make sure our hoses fit into place. And I'm happy to say everything looks pretty good. It's not perfect because tape isn't a weld, but overall this fits and with a little bit of modification to clear some of the welds once we actually go to affix it permanently, this is going to do the trick. So I said this plate here is just taped into place so the fitment isn't perfect, but should give you guys a really good idea of how this is going to work. Water will flow in and out and all of our lines are set up and run at this point. All I've got to do is remake our other end plate because I damaged it and we'll get the other side set up. And then I'm gonna have my buddy Brett finish weld all this so it turns out nice because looking at that, it ain't gonna come out good. So we'll get it all turned out nice and call all the charge air system done. In the last episode, we finished up by needing some small mounts at the end of these support rods for the rear wing uprights. So I fired up Fusion 360 once again and drew up these little guys. Now, could I have done this with old fashioned pen and paper? Of course, but I want them to come out nice, clean, and of course, symmetric. So I printed out some templates, cleaned off some old eighth inch plate steel I had in the shop, and got to work repeating the same process we just did for our end tanks. After tracing these out, I cut them out on the bandsaw once again, and then used the belt sander to clean up the edges and give us a nice clean finished part. I keep a cup of water nearby because these parts get hot really quick because of their small size. And as a tip, if you're trying to do this yourself, let the belt do the work. If you try to force it to grind for you, you'll wind up with uneven curves. Up next is giving these things some eight millimeter holes for our hardware, and then somewhere along the line, I bent them off camera. But we wound up with these, and I'm happy with how they turned out, and even though they're really small and simple on the surface, it's little jobs like this that tend to make a project like this take so long. You don't really account for the fact that you have to make every single little part and piece. I'm sure there's some sort of off-the-shelf tab I could use, but I wanted one that fit the purpose and fit the chassis, and so we make it ourselves. I spent some time measuring to make sure these tabs would wind up equidistant from the center of the chassis, and used the cutest little clamps you've ever seen so that I could clamp them into place and keep them from moving as I welded them down. Now it's time to weld them into place. Or not. Let's try that again. I can tell I'm getting more comfortable with the TIG welder because this was a position I struggled in just a number of months ago. And while I'm not welding every day or anything even close to that, I can tell the practice is adding up. All right, having just welded that, I know some of you guys are gonna say, why didn't you use weld through primer on the backside of those surfaces where they mate? And it's a fair question, but weld through primer isn't really weld through. I mean, it makes a mess, especially with TIG. Uh, and it's just, is it juice that's worth the squeeze? I don't know. Am I worried about those parts rusting underneath? Not really. For one, I'm gonna weld all the way around them, and two, any water content in there is going to be boiled during the welding process, and then it will be sealed up. I'm not too worried about it. I think that's a fear that can get carried way too far. I mean, think about roll cages, for example. The entire inside of them is completely bare on every roll cage ever. Do they rust from the inside out? I'm sure it's happened, but it's not a fear people have. Are roll cages thick material? Yeah, but again, I'm not worried about it. This car also isn't gonna get driven in the rain or the snow or anything like that. I think it's gonna be totally fine. All that's left on this project is to reinstall our support rods and get all of the hardware tightened down. Ultimately, I know this doesn't really look any different than the end of the last episode, but knowing that it's all finished, I can say I'm very happy with the overall outcome. So with all this hardware tightened down and everything kind of locked into position, these things are really nice and sturdy. I'm really happy with how they turned out. Uh, I can obviously move the entire back of the car with it and they don't flex a bit, which is as intended. 
these guys here are really only for that side to side movement. And what I just did was jerk the whole car side to side. So I know that they're doing their job and we really shouldn't see too much load on these at all. Uh, as far as fore and aft movement, these guys are so long that I'm really not worried about them moving whatsoever. And then obviously on the vertical axis, which is where our downforce is really gonna be pushing, these things should be more than strong enough. We should be able to put several hundred, if not over a thousand pounds of downforce straight down through these guys. And I'm pretty confident about all of the structure in here supporting it and these guys doing their intended job. So I'm happy with the outcome. As mentioned though, there was other stuff happening in the shop over the weekend. And it was mostly E36 content at that. Blake brought his Boston Green S52 car by to change his lower control arm bushings, and they put up a little bit of a fight. But while he went to war with his car, the rest of us went to war with each other. A PS4 wound up at the shop, which brought about some friendly competition on Gran Turismo Sport to see who could put down the best lap time on the Nürburgring GP circuit. And you know it was your boy Mikey B. Admittedly, this completely killed productivity for the day, but honestly, I'm alright with it. John's titanium silver S54 E36 needed some new tires, so he did what any rational enthusiast would do and sent his off in a blaze of glory. With the old tires completely worn away, it was time to get the new ones on, but his new 245-40 R comps proved to be a little bit big for his fenders. So we revisited something I haven't personally done in probably the better part of 10 years, rolling fenders. We got out the heat gun so that we could get the paint nice and hot to the touch to prevent from cracking it because that'll happen on cars of this age. And then we used the old Eastwood fender roller to massage those fenders out just a bit. We didn't go for broke or try to fold the lip in completely. We just gave John enough room to clear those tires and keep him from rubbing. And that brings us to my E36, and I have a very small update for you. I picked up some door cards from Vin over at Hoonigan over the weekend, and although I have since realized they're probably a little bit too rough to put into my car, I did get a bit of a score on some of his other parts and pieces. He had all of the black components needed for my headliner swap. This includes black visors and black grab handles above the doors. It's small details like this that can be hard to track down when you're doing a project like I'm undertaking, so I'm really glad to have found all this stuff in one fell swoop. All right, we are here. We are at the end of the episode. I've got nothing else for you today. No more automotive content. From here on out, it's just me and you, or I guess more realistically, me and 80,000 of you, and that's what I want to address. I want you to take a moment and imagine how you would feel if a stadium full of people, 80,000 people, supported something that you were doing. It would be a monumental experience. And I know that I'm just a face on a screen talking about cars, but I'm a human and I'm a real car enthusiast just like you. And this moment is just as monumental for me as it would be for you. And with that, I wanna say thank you. This is a huge milestone to me. And this episode in particular is the next to the last that I will be able to fit into my first year of making YouTube content. I uploaded my first Ferrari episode on December 11th of 2020. And in that year, 80,000 of you have decided to support and continue to come back and watch this content. And I wanna take a moment and show my gratitude. And honestly, words will never be enough. I can't really express how you guys make me feel, but this is something special. This is one year of a ton of hard work. I've poured my heart and my soul into this content. I spend a ridiculous number of hours trying to put the best content that I can together. And the fact that so many of you keep coming back means the world to me. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to those of you that are in the comments, leaving your feedback, both positive and negative. Thank you for those of you that are supportive with your words. Thank you to those of you that call me out and let me know when I'm wrong or if I've got something uh, incorrect or if I've overlooked something. Thank you to those of you that attempt to try to problem solve through all of the hurdles that this build presents. All of that means a ton. I read every single comment that you guys leave. I recognize all of those names and those familiar little icons. Thank you to all of you guys that are silent, but you keep coming back to watch this and to stay 
tuned for how this build is turning out or how any of these builds are. And I want you to know all of that means a ton to me. So thank you to each and every one of those 80,000 of you that keep coming back. I appreciate it.